Good morning, dear brothers and sisters. So this morning brings us to the third Sunday in the season of Lent and the third week in our sermon series this morning that we are titling, or subtitling rather, From Shadows to Reality. So we will look this morning primarily at our readings from Exodus chapter 20 and Romans chapter 7 to see the shadows that we see in Exodus chapter 20 emerge with a bit more clarity as we look at them in Romans chapter 7. So if you want to follow along, I'm not sure there's an easy way to do that this morning. You may have to put your finger in Romans chapter 7 because we'll be looking at Exodus chapter 20 first, or you can just trust that my quotes are actually <laughs> accurate. You may or may not know this about me, but I am not very dispositionally oriented toward following rules. It's been that way for as long as I can remember. It isn't that I don't intellectually understand that there is a need for rules, but, I, but that I feel this deep need for understanding the why behind the rules. Rules that seem arbitrary have always been hard for me. Now, I remember feeling this tension in the church while I was growing up. Like, I get that faith comes with rules necessarily. Still, though, especially in the tradition that I grew up in, I struggled with rules around what version of the Bible to read, what kind of music you were and were not allowed to listen to, what clothes you should wear to church, how often you should be telling people about Jesus, witnessing, as it was known, and so on and so forth, right? There were rules all around. And every time I had these probing questions of why these rules were the way that they were, I received what were, to me, unsatisfying answers. There was only so much of this that I could take before I just resigned to not being able to follow the rules at all. So I came up with my own somewhat arbitrary lines that were my own moral code. But it turns out that even my own self-made moral code was ultimately incredibly difficult to follow. So it ended up just being me doing whatever I wanted to do at any given moment. So I did whatever was right that I saw, or whatever I saw as right in my own mind at any given moment. So I lied, I cheated, I abused, and I ju justified all of these things until Scripture began to draw me in, right? And God began to transform my heart. It was a pretty overnight transformation, but it wasn't a perfect transformation at all. Because because of my background in the church that I grew up in, I immediately assumed that, that following Jesus meant following all the rules from the church that I grew up in. And perhaps there, this was these rules were just the price that I would have to pay in order to have a relationship with Jesus. Now don't get me wrong, I was so gripped and drawn in by the scriptures that I was willing to pay just about any cost to follow Jesus. If it meant only ever listening to Christian music from that point on, it was a, a price I was willing to pay. If it meant never drinking alcohol again, it was a price I was willing to pay. If it meant wearing suits every Sunday to church, well, I'm not sure I was willing to pay that price. But, but there was all of these things and whatever the price, I was willing to pay it. The more I read the scriptures though, the more I realized that none of these things that were held so valuable in the church that I grew up in were actually discussed in the Bible at all. They were little more, it seemed, than another person's version of my arbitrary moral code for myself. And as humans, we are really good at this. I mean, like, really good at coming up with our own way of ordering our lives. A line from the last verse in the book of Judges in the Old Testament describes this phenomenon perfectly. Judges 21, 25 says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. 
Does that refrain sound familiar to you? It is absolutely ingrained in the cultural waters in which we swim. It's all around us, all the time. Who has the right to tell me to do what I can and cannot do? It's all over social media. It's be, even being codified into public discourse. To have power and to not get canceled in our culture means one must bow down to whatever arbitrary desires everyone else has on any given day. The logic goes like this. I am utterly unique. So I need an utterly unique moral code all to myself. Everyone does what's right in their own eyes and sadly we in the church aren't really much better. We take the scriptures and we arbitrarily pick ones that we like to follow. This or that command is for me. But those ones that I don't like I'll justify some other way for it not to mean what it seems to say or find some way that it could not possibly apply to me. So into our, into our culture's confusion and moral chaos, the Lord, I believe, has a word for us this morning. This is a word for all cultures at all times, obviously, but I think especially it's a word for those cultures like ours where we are prone to do whatever we see is right in our own eyes. And into this context, the Lord speaks. One of the most incredible statements in the entirety of the Bible comes in Exodus chapter 21, verse 1, into the chaos. It says, and God spoke all these words. God spoke. The God who showed up at Mount Sinai to speak is a God of unapproachable holiness. The people had to be consecrated for three days. They had to wash their clothes. They had to set themselves apart for the Lord. To even touch the mountain meant to lose one's life. God shows up and he shows up in amazing ways. He shows up in smoke, in fire. The mountain trembles, it says, and the sound of it like a trumpet grew louder and louder. Can you picture this scene? It's amazing. And in this scene, the God of unapproachable holiness speaks to his people. The God who spoke the earth into existence, who formed the first man of the dust of the earth and breathed life into that dust and made him man, who called Abraham and made him a, a great nation, a father of many nations who brought those nations into existence through a barren womb, who delivered the people out of slavery in Egypt. This God who, because he created, knows the hearts and minds of humans, speaks from Sinai. And what he speaks is grace to humans. Now you might be thinking at this point, if you're looking at your Bible in Exodus chapter 20, that the heading at the top of that section is the Ten Commandments, which is part of the Mosaic Law, right? A, a sort of summary of the whole law. It's Ten Commandments, it's law, it's not grace. But we'll just have to agree to disagree if that's what you're thinking. Because God can make rules for us for the reason previously stated, that because He loves us and made us and knows us, he knows how to live our lives better than we do. So if God is the one who is making the rules and he is by his very nature good, then the rules must be for our benefit and not arbitrary in any way. What we see in every single one of the Ten Commandments is not a rule to restrict us from something good but meant to help us live as we were created to live, even in his command to have no other gods before him. He isn't restricting us from having other good gods, but simply acknowledging the reality that we were meant, that we were created with, a desire for the one true God. It's this sentiment that's described by St. Augustine as, as the restless heart that can only find rest in God. And by Blaise Pascal as a sort of God-shaped vacuum 
It exists in the heart of every person which can only be filled by God the Creator. He knows what is best for us and He offers that to us in the Ten Commandments. He offers clarity on how to live in relationship with Him, with with the God of the universe, and also how to have a right relationship with one another. Because we were also created for relationships with other humans, by the way. So it is in these contexts of both our relationship with God and our relationship with our fellow humans that God speaks. And without a doubt, what he says is for the purpose of our thriving. This is essentially Paul's stance as he begins to to discuss the law in Romans 7. The law of Moses is summarized in the Ten Commandments again, and Jesus goes on to further summarize that in the Gospels into loving God with all of your heart, mind, and strength, with every aspect of who you are as a human, and loving your neighbor as yourself. So Paul says in verse 12 of chapter 7, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. The law is good, brothers and sisters, and it is good for us. See, this is the perspective of the Jewish people that Paul would have shared Psalm 19, which is the the psalm reading appointed for today, gives us a glimpse at the Jewish understanding of the law. The psalmist says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. This is a love of the law that we have a difficult time understanding because of our cultural context. Now maybe you're different from me, but I have a sort of equation in my head that goes like this. Law equals bad. Even though I know the truth, I know that a society without law would be a miserable place to live. Can you imagine what that would be like if there were no laws? So life without law, I think, is always miserable. I've had this conversation with my kids time and time again. The rules that you have to follow are for your good. You aren't allowed to play in the street, not because I don't love you and want to keep you from doing something that's, that's fun, but because I love you, right? And I don't want you to experience the potential consequences of what happens when you play in the street, right? I know that the potential consequences aren't worth the potential fun of playing in the street. So there's a rule, right? We don't play in the street. In Romans, though, Paul doesn't just deal with the Jewish law, right? There, that's an aspect of what he's talking about. He doesn't just describe his love for the law, but he begins to discuss another law, another unfortunate law that he has witnessed in his own life, and that is the law of sin. Right? He asks this hypothetical question, Did that which is good then bring death to me? Because the law has been used to show what sin is and and we know now that the wages of sin is death. Now it's a logical question, but he adamantly answers that question, no. The sin produces death. This is a fine distinction. Sin is merely shown what it is, sin. Transgression of the commandments of God. So through this discussion of the law of sin, it really does feel like this phenomenon that I described in my introduction, and that we all experience all around us all the time, the law that Paul describes as another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So his final question is, who will deliver me from this body of death? Who will deliver me from this unending situation where I keep doing the things that I don't want to do 
because I know with all of my heart and with all of my mind what is right. Who will deliver me? Jesus. Right? Jesus. Jesus will deliver us once and for all, one day, from this tension that we experience between our desire to follow God and our subjective sense of what is right and wrong. Not only that, but he is delivering us now, in the here and the now, right? By the power of the Holy Spirit, or to put it in the terms of the next chapter in Romans, the law of the spirit of life has set us free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Notice that it isn't the law of God from which we are set free. Again, the law of God is inherently good and will always be the right way to live. The Ten Commandments will still be the law in heaven. Hear me well. Because they reflect the eternal and unchanging character of God. They were the law before they were ever actually given. We see it in Genesis when Cain kills Abel and he's punished for it. Before the commandment to, never mur- to not murder is ever given, Cain is punished for murdering. The law is eternal and unchanging. Love God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Where do you get the rules that you live by? Do you just do whatever feels right? Do you follow the law of doing what is right in your own eyes? Now, this is normal in our culture, right? Yet it is wholly and utterly devastating people's lives over and over again. Or maybe you are following the rules of social science, human social science. Now, I really enjoy watching videos and reading stuff about this. This is the This is the stuff that's advocated by the Jordan Petersons of the world, the Jocko Willinks, the Andrew Hubermans, the the David Goggins of the world. It is wisdom, but it's not God's law. It is wise, and what most of these guys are advocating for is is observable reality, right? Stuff we we can observe and figure out. Like, it does actually make you feel better if you get in ice baths. Against all odds, it does actually make you feel better. It actually improves your mental health to make your bed every day. Now, these are observable, actual, helpful things. Yet none of these will ever be ultimately satisfying. Or perhaps you're following human religious rules, which have no basis in the scriptures. Now, I gave examples of some, of, some things from my own experience in the church earlier, but it's everywhere, right? I mean, for 1,600 years of church history, the Catholic Mass was only ever said in Latin. Nowhere in the scriptures could ever be inferred to mean that the service must be offered only ever in Latin. That that does not exist in scripture. There are all sorts of things like that, though. Evaluate and make sure that the law you're following is God's law. Will you screw up? Well, if the if, we, if the track record of the entirety of human existence, with the exception of Jesus, has anything to say about it, I'm going to say that you probably will fail. Does this change your standing with God, though? No, right? Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Receive that and soak it in. There is now no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus, none. If God is not condemning you, why are you condemning yourself? And why are you condemning others? Follow the law to the best of your ability, strengthened by the Holy Spirit of God, because it is good for you. Not because you're obligated in some way and are being punished by being made to live that way. The law law of God is sweeter than honey, dear brothers and sisters. Do you believe it? See, I believe this is so important for how we interact as a body. We must hold fast to the truth that God knows how to live our lives better than we do. That there are longings within us that are deeper than our superficial desires. And how to fulfill those longings is going to be better answered by the one who created them in the first place. 
That said, it's just as important to how we treat one another when we fail to live according to God's law. We have to respond first without condemnation or judgment. That isn't to say that we waffle in our understanding of God's desires for us. It is to say that we be humble enough to understand uh, through looking at our own sin to allow us to have, to allow that to give us compassion for our fellow struggling sinners. We need not relax the standards of God to do so, though. We can encourage one another with the truth in compassion and love while realizing that we are fellow travelers on the journey toward becoming more like Jesus, the perfect human. How to perfectly apply this upholding of the standards of God's law in light of grace as he has shown us will be a forever journey, I believe. But it has to be the point that we are aimed at and the thing that we are most striving for, Christ-likeness. And I could not be more grateful <laughs> to get to do and to strive toward this goal with you all. It is a joy to be on this journey with you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.